So for those of you in the room, it is, seems to be a more intimate event than the room accommodates. So I thought it would be better if you guys can come closer to us, maybe? Because we want to do it more of a dialogue and, and not like shout. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, as, as close as you feel comfortable. I know the first row, my days in college, is not a, a popular spot. <laughs> but if you, if you dare to come, you're not going to be the teacher's pet, we promise. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. So I think we would like to go ahead and start. Um, I think we're going to start with introductions. This is meant to be a dialogue. And if you have questions, just feel free to. We've got just a few, so pretty informal. Um, my name is Orna Berryman, and we'll start by introducing this wonderful panel. I'm going to be the moderator. And um, I'm very privileged to work with uh, two of these amazing women. Uh, I'm managing the technical program managers uh, under the services in Google Cloud. And uh, I've been with Google for about six months. So I'm pretty new to the open source world and to the community. And before that, I worked at VMware, uh, also involved in programs in the open source community and areas in VMware. And Jasmine, Jasmine uh, Jaksik is here from Google. Hey, everyone. Um, I work at Google, and I've been there for about four years. Um, I specifically work on Istio, uh, which is an open source project. When I'm not uh, doing my day job, I have a startup uh, which uses 3D camera to help and improve users' posture. Um, I'm also a contributing writer for New York Times, um, Huffington Post, and Wired. Uh, but these days, I get to do very little of all of those because I have a two-month-old who's keeping me very busy. And we have Le Meng Wang. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, so I joined Google three years ago. Uh, I am a software engineer for more than 11 years. Uh, so, uh, the, day, uh, the first day I joined Google, I started working on an open source project, uh, which is called uh, Cloud Endpoints, ESP. Uh, and uh, it was an uh, NGX-based proxy, uh, which provides security and uh, monitoring for applications running behind it. Uh, then after that, uh, I, uh, when the Istio project starts, I uh, switched from uh, cloud endpoint security to Istio security, and uh, then I worked on Istio security since then. Great. Yeah. Uh, uh, so personally, uh, I am a mom of uh, uh, two kids, uh, two boys, six and four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I spend uh, uh, most of my uh, re uh, like um, family time <laughs> with uh, my two kids. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, we have Lin Sun from IBM. Uh, good morning, everyone. So um, I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I've been working for IBM for many, many years, uh, since 2001, so 17 years. Look forward to get my 20 years, because they gave us uh, five extra days of vacation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started working on the Istio project since, uh, I guess, about a year ago. Uh, we. Uh, my management team asked me, hey, uh, you just got promoted. Uh, there's uh, um, Docker is not, I was working on Docker for IBM Cloud, and the project wasn't turning very well at, back then. I think the management uh, made the right decision, because you guys can probably see the Docker booth wasn't very crowded uh, in tech conference this year. <laughs> so they were ask me, well, we are going to increase our contribution to Kubernetes ecosystem, and Istio was the project they wanted me to work on. I was actually quite hesitant. I was like, geez. I haven't worked on open source for a long time. 
but I decided to take up the challenge and work on Istio. And I'm really happy I actually did. I was able to work with the amazing people in the community, been learning every day. So it's been a really good experience for me. Uh, outside of work, I have uh, two kids. Uh, I have a 13-year-old, is a teenage, um, and a 10-year-old, which I actually brought uh, to KubeCon with me. So I feel like I'm actually getting brave enough to bring him and uh, I always you know wanted to kind of try the child care program uh, provided by KubeCon you know I'm nervous on how good it is and everything and then I decided you know he's tracked out um, he's not at school so we, we don't have to make excuse and I decide to have him with me. I'll give you guys a report on how the child care program goes. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's uh, what keeps me busy outside of work. Thank you. I forgot to tell you, I have four kids and the ages are not relevant because it, you are all very good in math and uh, I refuse to <laughs> give away anything, but my son does work at Google, so you can do some random, <laughs> you can round up. Um, what drew you particularly to open source? And if we can start with uh, Jasmine. Um, so this is back in the day um, when, you know, like everyone else, I was using Windows 95. Um, three years later, we just wait because there are bugs and we want new features and then there's Windows 98 and there's really nothing much you can do. Um, and then I came across Linux. And to me, it was like, wow, it was a whole new experience. Um, you hear there was a product that you can turn it into what you want, you can share, you can um, build on it, and it was fantastic. And um, that was my first um, interest into the whole concept of open source. Uh, but I got to be honest, I really did not contribute much in that space until I started working at Google. Um, I worked on endpoints, now on Istio, and um, so yeah, that's how I got into open source. Great. Uh, yeah, actually, um, similar to Jasmine, I also started uh, uh, working on open source uh, after I joined Google. Uh, before that, I was in VMware, and uh, I never worked on open source before. And uh, yeah, I think the open source experience was uh, pretty good. And uh, I started uh, from the Core Endpoints project. Right. It was, uh, at the beginning, it, uh, uh, it's actually mainly developed by Googlers. Uh, then it later goes to open source. Yeah. Yeah, um, but Istio is uh, quite different. Istio was open from the beginning. Right. And yeah, like some community. companies do that yeah. more generously, right? The, right? the accommodation for open source projects it sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I have a longer history <laughs> working on open source. Um, I think um, back then when we were working on application server, IBM purchased a company called uh, GlueCode, which became a lightweight version of application server. So that's backed by Apache project called Apache Geronimo. So I started working uh, part-time open source on that. I did gain like committer status to that project and become a PMMC, I think it's a project management community member. And after that, I've also become a committer to Apache Ares, which is another project. Um, so out of these projects, Istio is the one actually that's most exciting to me because I really like the diversity of the project. Out of the two or three projects I worked on, only Istio was like a real diverse project that has a rich ecosystem and growing number of committers from various different companies. My other two projects was pretty much the IBM dominant project, which is not really as exciting as um, a project that's really well diversified. So I'm really happy to be the place I'm in to work on this project. Thank you. So there's, uh, there was a survey done by, was it Red Hat, Jasmine, I think? Um, Around uh, women in the open source community. And there, there are multiple surveys, but the statistics overall in the market today are if you count all departments, you'd have about 30 to 40, depends on the company, high-tech company, women are, are part of the company, but that includes marketing, HR, all supporting roles. When you go to the tech roles, it dwindles down to 15 to 20, 25 really pushes it. 
but mostly it's about 20. But then if you go to the open source projects, the stats vary between 3%, which was the 5,500 uh, sample population that was done in that survey, to five max. And the question that I have for this panel, because you are the selected few, is why do you think this is the case? What is in these particular projects that cause that sort of a skewed, low female population? Anyone? Sure. Jasmine. Um, yeah, so if you go to opendiversity.org uh, slash 2017, that actually has the breakdown of the survey that they did. They interviewed, uh, or they actually reached out to 5,500 contributors, and of which 95% of them identified as men, right? 3% uh, women, I'm guessing 1% is uh, people who did not want to disclose, and one was non-binary. So um, to Orna's point, it's 3% compared to 20 or 30% even by our abysmal standards of tech. Um, which the, the huge disparity, in my uh, opinion, comes from lots of different reasons, but one of, his, one of that is when you work for a place like IBM or Google or Oracle, um, we have HR departments, we have uh, policies in place. Yeah, there are times people do things that are unacceptable and they get away with it, uh, but most of the times those systems work really well. But we don't have anything like that in open source, right? And in that same survey, they were trying to figure out what kind of bad behaviors happen. And it's a spectrum. It goes all the way from name calling and mild insults all the way down to stalking and harassment. Um, so what could we do about it? I think the first step would be to have code of conduct. There is a lot that has gone into, I think it's called a contributor's covenant. A lot of pioneering women have stepped into it and produced this amazing uh, you know, documentation, and you can look it up. And I think over 40,000 projects have already adopted that, including uh, projects like TensorFlow. And so if you work on a project that does not have a code of conduct, um, that might be the easiest place to start. Right? Create one um, or adopt um, contributors covenant or do both. Um, it's not difficult to do. And if you see behavior that is not unacceptable, and if you witness it, um, of course, it, you don't have to just speak up for yourself. You also speak up for others. Um, in that same survey, it was interesting because they said 50% of people have witnessed some sort of bad behavior, and that alone was a deterrent for them to enter into a project. If you think about it, for projects where they don't have any rules and where the behavior is bad, one in every two person decided to walk away from it because they didn't think it was welcoming enough. So I think that's an easy fix. Does that resonate with the audience? Because I saw some heads nodding and I wanted to know. And by the way, the mic is as yours as it is ours. So if anyone wants to speak up, uh, if it resonates, we'd like to hear from you later. Yes. It's usually good to have moderators, but I think we all own the responsibility, right? And I'll give a very specific example with Istio. Uh, when we started this, we didn't have, uh, I mean, even now, it's a relatively young project. It's been around for like two years. Uh, we launched it to 1.0 a few months ago, right? So um, we have hundreds of contributors, not thousands or millions, but even with that, um, there was an example where we had a doc and uh, there were, uh, it, it just, the comments, people are so passionate, it started getting escalated, you know, and they were, who are you to talk about this? I know better, you know, that sort of behavior. Um, and uh, we have Sven, who is the founder of Istio here, um, and he has played a, that's Sven, by the way. He's played a huge role in actually uh, curbing that sort of behavior. Sven and I noticed some of that. We reached out to the people, 
um, again, because it's a relatively smaller project, we reached out to, we know who the contributors are. We reached out to them, we had a conversation. So a lot of it, if you think about it, was not intended, right? It was not malicious. It's not like I'm gonna say something just to piss off 10 different people. As much as in the heat of the moment you say things, uh, but just having the conversation with them has toned down that sort of behavior, and I think that's the easiest way to do this. Thank you. Yes, one more, and then we'll ask also Lynn and Limin their observations. Go ahead. Yes. Um, following on with that somewhat, pardon, how, what is the code of conduct role in addressing things that are less heat of the moment, things that are more just casual discussiveness, things that are giving a, a male speaker a benefit of the doubt and, you know, that are not, things that are deniable and not like gross violation, but just as obnoxious and, and frustrating. You know, um, it's interesting. I don't want to hog the mic. I'm going to pass it on after this one. Um, but there was a study that said uh, women's code. I mean, if I was, if I'm going to submit a PR, the likelihood of it being uh, accepted and uh, people not, you know, getting into all these uh, debates and issues is a lot lower if I don't put a picture of myself there and if I have a name that's not very gender specific. That's sad. It's, it's, uh, I, I think one way to combat that would be to, um, well, there are lots of different ways to combat it. One is um, we all have imposter syndromes, especially with women, right? And you, um, I think it was uh, Hemingway who famously said, uh, time is the least uh, of what we have. Um, so instead of somebody struggling with a project, figuring out where to start and how to get involved, uh, you could tag issues where, you know, it could be a starter issue for someone who was uh, in the sidelines but want to get involved. With this CEO, we actually label issues with help wanted, which is a great place for someone to get started. Um, and beyond that, if you still, you know, you're hesitant, you want to talk to somebody, um, for our project, there are three of us here, and there are a lot more people behind us, you know, who are not in this panel right now, who would be more than happy to mentor you, help you, right? If you have questions, and if you think, is this, is this a stupid question? If I ask, will somebody beat me up on this? Reach out to us. Uh, there are forums, and we are more than happy to step in. Yes? So I'm hearing this being more assertive, labeling uh, behaviors, and then uh, not being afraid of that conflict, and that's the way that conflict is, is sort of down for um, code of conduct helps to a great extent, I think, with the setting the stage. Um, having starter issues is a good way to encourage them to step in. And once they step in and they're struggling, we can do things like mentorship. Uh, we can also do recognition. Um, there is, um, Red Hat has, uh, they give out awards every year for women in open source. So if you know someone who's working on it and if you think they're doing a fantastic job, you should nominate them. I think uh, Lumen and uh, Lynn actually... have some, and then we'll go, <laughs> come to you. Thank you. Yes. Lumen, you want to talk about what we could do about it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, I think for us, uh, it's a part of our daily job. We start getting into open source. Or maybe for Lynn, it's a little bit different. You actually get into open source uh, earlier. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of more people over there, and uh, they are not paid for contributing to open source world. And uh, for, for these kind of people, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it will be a uh, benefit if we have some kind of program that attracts these people to come in to contribute to open source projects. So, uh, Lynn, do you want to talk, uh, you've been in the community so many years, what we could do about it? Yeah, so I feel there are a couple of challenges uh, just with me personally. I think it's probably among women also. One is the intimidating. Sometimes uh, when you are not talking to people face to face, when you talk to people remote and through messaging, Slack, email, you could be very intimidated and to share your opinion. And once you actually do have uh, brave enough to share your thoughts, uh, sometimes because of our thoughts could be different than the majority of the members in the community, which are males, uh, we could be perceived as nobody else is doing a plus one on you because your thoughts are different. Um, I, I guess the one way my mentor kind of teaches me is, uh, you know, um, he was always saying, uh, if the other guy can finish his sentence, 
because they have the exact same thoughts, then why would IBM have two of them? <laughs> so that's what I always kind of encourage me to, you know, if I actually have a different opinion, to kind of say it out loud in a design document. But the reality is a lot of other people, you know, they may not appreciate a different angle, a different diverse opinion. So it's just very hard for a woman to get their words out mm -hmm. there and that may not yeah. even be accepted. And I think that's also related to the PI issue and commenting on design, uh, commenting on GitHub issues. So this intimidating and uh, not be able to have a diverse um, um, thoughts around within the community. I think that's uh, two of the hard things I had. The third hard thing also, uh, open source normally comes with travel. I know when my kids were young, you know, I'm not up to travel. I, I think women are, tends to be a little bit more content with their jobs in general. They are not, I think men are mostly more aggressive as far as moving up to their career ladder, be able to travel, get to the conference, I feel I was the same when I was having my kids at baby or toddler age. I think I'm a little bit growing to that age, you could grow out of that age, but I think that has been a, um, a factor for me mm -hmm. personally also. Right. Yeah. Thank you, and yes, go ahead here in the white shirt. Oh, um, so I, I want to circle back around to this because I, I don't think that it's being addressed in, in these conversations around what, what we're talking about is governance. Right, the code of conduct is in and of itself cannot be considered an end all. Um, and I will point to some very common examples. You know, Linus Torvalds personally probably prevented untold uh, amounts of contribution to Linux projects, and he admitted because he was an asshole. You know, it's just called like we see it. Uh, Theo over in Open BSD land, the same thing. Uh, Brendan Ike was mysteriously nominated for, for CEO of Mozilla and, and stepped down because of outcry. We have to maintain, if we're going to run an open source project, we have to maintain aggressive governance on the community or we're by default excluding anybody, including men. There's plenty of men who are impacted by this. Seth Fargo uh, was a, a, a chef contributor and, and quit because he was receiving death threats. I mean, this is the level of escalation that can happen. And I think that it's any, anyone who's going to run an open source community needs to be willing to have someone or a, a body that will enforce the expulsion of bad behavior actively, right? I don't think there's any two ways around it. We cannot rely on honor systems because the quiet voices will be shot at down. Now, do we have any? Yes, I want to applaud you. Thank you. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. Um, I do think we need to have moderators. I do uh, think there needs to be some sort of a responsibility by the projects that run open source, uh, but. I also don't want to exclude the fact that there are a lot of um, people who contribute to it, right, around the world, and that's the whole point of open source. The entry is not that you have an employment or there's an interview, you know, like the, the only thing that's stopping you from contributing is your interest and level of commitment. Um, so even as someone who is not a moderator, I think if you encounter that sort of behavior, it's, it's important to call it out. I think in some ways the responsibility lies within all of us. The fact that there's so many of you in this room means you guys all care about it, right? There's so many events happening at this very time, but you've taken the time to walk across to an entirely different building, by the way. I don't know why they did that. In the rain. And, and you're all here. So I, I think in some sense, the responsibility lies in all of us. I want to ask the audience a question. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's, there is a missing accountability. And the, the more uh, people maintain the project, they have more control and authority, okay? So there's, there's no way around that. Um, what else can we do to encourage uh, where there is good behavior? So, you know, the groups I'm a part of, you know, one thing I do when I'm trying to do when I'm leading a group is to check in with different people in the meeting that wouldn't normally have before, right? So there's proactive things that people that are in leadership positions need to be doing, okay? Right. And so I think there's an encouragement, and maybe the Linux Foundation or other, other DOC and CF can start highlighting uh, through case studies and things like this. This is what this is what we're proposing. This is the model of good. So when it's like, that's bad, there's like, it's hard, that's not concrete uh, for a lot of people. So I think there's a, to, I think it's a two-phase or, or two lenses that DOC needs to be tackling. 
It's very important for us in the, once you are in the community to actually, it's the job of every single one of you here, as much as, as it is if somebody's throwing like a litter on the floor, you can say, okay, there's a police person that can give them a ticket, there's somebody who's gonna clean it up. But I'm witnessing this, I really need to step in because if we, we can, don't always have the paid moderators and companies that would hire someone just to make that smooth. It's all a little bit like a social responsibility. It's distributed, it's in all of us. The second thing I wanna say is every single one of you here, the challenge that Lynn was talking about is just to enter and then I've got a question and this void, like, void of people, I'm, I would be afraid sometimes to maybe ping someone, but if you guys can say, hey, you know what, there's this very cool project, come join with me, you can ask me questions, become the, the person in your own companies that can be that, that um, ambassador. Uh, and pick a woman, and really, you don't have to revolutionize the word. One woman, that is plenty, because in this room we've got easily you know, 40 people. So that would be 40 more contributors. Yes, go ahead. Uh, follow on to parts of what both of you just said. Um, people, first of all, I think people hesitate at best to join communities where they don't immediately see people who look like them. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so I think it's really important to keep without, you know, I mean, it. it Borders on tokenism, but it's the only way you get past tokenism, is to keep diversity front and center in every public presentation mm -hmm. of, of a community. Um, the, the thing about, yes, everybody is responsible for the behavior of the community, the, the call out behavior that I've seen and that I'm afraid of on that, without backing from project leadership, is that there is and I've worked in, around, building from, running open source since um, gotta be before some people in this room were born. And um, yeah, I mean, I worked at and on SendMail in 1990, so yeah. Um, that um, there's this very mistaken idea and destructive idea that open source communities are a meritocracy. And often that means, I don't care how big an asshole you are, your code is valuable. And, but on top of that, it means that people will band together around valuable contributors without seeing- Yeah, there is a as, following, that for as sure. As important as contributing to the project right. is contributing to the community and not being a net negative on the community. Right. And, and so I think, yes, the community has to call out behavior, but it really has to be backed by project leadership. The leadership even is volunteer, key. Even if it's right. voluntary project, project leadership. Okay. Thank you for this insight. Do if you, I can I yeah, add something to what you said. Um, we, uh, so you're right, we have, um, based on the different projects, right, in Kubernetes you have six. With Istio you have steering committees and technical oversight committees. And for the most part, um, you're absolutely right, we look at the level of contribution, and I think an important element to also start considering going forward, uh, not just with these two projects, but everything across the board, is how do you, um, what do you do for the community outside of writing code? Do you provide mentorship? Do you provide guidance? Do you, does your behavior um, present as a model for others to mimic? Or are you, like you said, being an a-hole and that should bar you from you know, getting uh, positions like that? Yes, go ahead. I, I work with, uh, this has been looming over me for a while. I, I work with two very talented individuals and I, I trying to, I think it's difficult to see your career path and find that uh, without a mentor. Uh, there's a lot of thrashing that happens, and I am personally looking for uh, a community uh, program or some some place where I can direct or kind of help coach these individuals into making those connections. Hopefully, not losing them from our team at the same time, <laughs> once other people see how talented they are. 
sort of a starter pro uh, starter program. Is there anything like that? I, you I heard there are some uh, like a mentorship program out there. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, maybe it only applies to students. It's uh, for, called a Google Sum of Code. Uh, basically, it tries to match students with uh, the open source projects. And, uh, uh, and Google is going to fund the students for their summer projects. Um, basically, uh, the students will submit the proposals uh, for the open source projects. And the open source project organizers, they will review the students' proposals and uh, then identify the, uh, the good candidates and uh, also provide the mentors for these students. And uh, they can work over the summer. And Google is going to make sure the students are get paid. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, I'm not sure if there are other mentorship program for not so students, right? Like we for have someone the in the country. audience that... I just want to add, uh, it's called uh, opendiversity.org. Open diversity if you go there, there are a ton of projects that are dedicated to um, open source projects, and uh, specifically projects where you can uh, sign up to be a mentor, sign up to be a sponsor, so you can start sponsoring projects where you're encouraging diversity. There are a lot of ways to engage. It's, um, it's called opendiversity.org, open source diversity. So we'll have Lynn and then we have an audience comment. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say uh, KubeCon actually did a really good job uh, having the mentorship program. I don't know if many of you signed up to be a mentor and mentee, so I think tomorrow there are two sessions, and I did sign up for one of them. I couldn't do the other one because they didn't offer a child care program. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I think we should ask uh, Linux Foundation as a general, can they do this beyond the conference, right? Because many of us are not um, have the luxury to travel to the conference. Can Linux Foundation have this to be an ongoing project like the website you were mentioning so people are be able and be able to have that recognition within the community, like within our project. We're not only looking at people who make the most PR and contribution, but also looking at um, who they actually do mentor and give back, who actually empower other people to grow. So I think great. that would be really good. Uh, and there was a comment? Yeah, yeah. it was just um, people were mentioning Google Summer's Code, and there is another organization called Outreachy, so mm -hmm. Outreachy does yeah. all, which focuses on um, diversity. So could, you, code, could you repeat the name into the mic? Out, uh, it's called, it's called Outreachy. Outreachy. Outreachy? Yeah. Outreachy. Okay. And in that site, I think they have a ton more. There's something uh, about a um, million women to code. There, there are a ton of them. And I think um, open source diversity.org has a long list of all those projects. I want to, beyond the, we've, we've heard mentoring, we've heard teaming up, we've heard citizenship. Um, that is a joint responsibility. I want to talk about the monetary aspect of open source projects. Is that uh, something that is a deterrent for women to join? Are these particular jobs less stable potentially? Um, are these careers less lucrative or, are, or not as safe? Is there any monetary aspect that we can influence within our companies? It's more of a question for the audience and for the panel. Um, there was a there was an initiative that started a while ago called gittip.org, I'm going to say. Um, it eventually got shut down. I mean, the idea is that you would uh, sponsor a project, whether it's 25 cents a week or $100 a week, and then you get anonymous, uh, but usually marginalized programmers to step in and start you know, working on projects and they get paid for it, right? To Lemon's point, um, it's true that disproportionately women end up doing more uh, domestic work or you know caregivers, and they don't have the bandwidth to um, go work on projects where you're not going to get paid. So this was one good way to do it. But for various reasons I, I, that I won't get into in this discussion, that site got shut down. Uh, but there are a ton of others. Um, I forget the name, it's Fund uh, Project or something like that. Again, they have raised now close to $300,000 uh, just to you know, pay people uh, from the different marginalized groups to step up and start engaging. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Yeah, yeah I think, um, yeah, like uh, paid, uh, um, 
paid work for uh, doing the open source uh, project is uh, one way. Another way is uh, like the childcare. Like we spent a lot of time uh, taking care of the kids, uh, like especially women. And uh, if we have, uh, if there is uh, some support for childcare, then it will free up more women to do uh, more open source work uh, at their free time. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, I do think having money, like paying people, if woman is not the breadwinner in the house, it may or may not help. Like, if you're not, uh, you know, if you're not uh, wanting the extra money because you are a secondary job to your household, it may not make that difference. But but for me personally, you know, um, having you know good childcare program that you feel comfortable with, that's the hardest thing. Because the woman always have. Well, are very picky with childcare and are always, I feel like having the emotional rewarding, it could be also very rewarding. Having the surrounding supporting system beyond just money, I think it's tremendously important for women who are not necessarily the breadwinner in the house. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to mention um, from when you, the panel introduced themselves, um, I think at least two of you didn't get into open source until you started working at IBM and, and Google. Right. And I think that in, in technology as it exists today, particularly in our field, the uh, ability for corporations to engage with open source, um, I think is increasingly critical for a couple of reasons. One is it provides a secure, uh, supported way to get involved with projects, which I think helps everyone, uh, particularly those who might feel less inclined for financial reasons. And the other way is, speaking as a manager, I've also noticed that um, from a like a new hire perspective, op open source contributions are considered um, close to or equal, or in some cases superior to say having the college internship as a student. And so I think if we, with, as members of the open source community, to encourage the, the companies to further support and have their, you know, more and more of their employees contribute, I think there's a good cycle there um, that would be much more enabling, not everybody can drop everything and go to San Diego with the fall comp for three months, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they have an excellent internship program, but if they could be at home and be working on an open source uh, project that was equally as valuable to their CV, that's a huge win. Mm -hmm. It's a great suggestion. Okay, I sponsored you again. <laughs> from SAP, so. I think Dan, we just had a, we opened our open source office recently, but there's a commitment that's getting more and more from global, and then we're trying to push it where we're, uh, one of the executives, one of our bosses, yeah, he's pushing through to try to get dedicated time uh, weekly where people can contribute either to inner source or open source projects. And so that commitment, it can't rely on superstars that have ex, you know, tons of extra personal time. It has to be, not like work life balance for it, but synergy in our life. So um, those are the, like, is that the type of thing that you're talking about? Like that type of intentional commitment from the corporations? I, I, I mean, yes, it, it could be that. And then the other benefit I can imagine is now you have the weight of that corporation. For example, there's, I don't even know how many Google employees contribute to Kubernetes, for example, there are hundreds. Um, now you, have, you also have the additional weight of those companies who can help, for example, uh, inform governance. Right, and so I think there's just kind of a win-win around all of that if we can get more companies to engage. And it's great to see, you know, all of those premier companies on that sponsorship list because there's a lot more that don't have a lot of engagement. Yeah. So we, we do have to wrap up, so we have one last comment. Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to comment on, or follow up on that a little bit. Like the whole, like uh, the, the security of being paid to work on open source. So I've worked on the same project for 15 years now and I've never made any money from it. It's not entirely true. It's something I've been looking at doing, stuff like that now. Um, like I started live streaming my contributions on Twitch. So I get some revenue from that. Um, I've looked at Tidelift. Tidelift's <laughs> not an option. Um, I have a Patreon, all that. And these are things where like, I don't get paid to do it, so obviously I have to have a day job. So it's like, I spend a good 10 to 20 hours a week outside of work, working on open source just to drive the project. And it sucks, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so it's like, one of the other problems is like the project, it's, it's an old one and it's been declining over time. So like one of the things we're trying to do is be more inclusive, get more people involved, all of that. So like, um, like I said, I've been involved with the project since 2003. I took it over in January of 17. I keep forgetting if it's 16 or 17, it doesn't matter. 
Um, but like one of the things we first did is we made things more visible by doing pull requests. And like, and then with me doing the live stream stuff, that helps people like actually identify with the maintainer. Because like most of the time, how are you interacting with everybody? It's email, chat, whatever. Things get lost in communication, all that. But we're like, we are actually talking on stream or like live. People will be like, oh, this is a person and this is the way they said that. Even though these words, if I read it, I might have read it in a different way. But now that I like see how they're talking, they're using their hands, different body language and all that, it helps a lot. Um, and so, that's actually brought in some contributors too, but like our program is a big pile of C code, so nobody wants to work on that. <laughs> the aspect of, of it's a, almost a hobby that right. is unpaid. So we do have to wrap it up, so we want to just ask one thing before you leave. And thank you so much for joining us, by the way. We're feeling very privileged that you took your time. Uh, in one or two sentences, Lynn, what well, would be the message to this audience? Yeah, I would recommend everybody to uh, take a woman and mentor them. Um, take and a woman. Uh, we do one at a time. Thank you. Lemon. Yeah, uh, I think uh, promoting a friendly and welcoming community is uh, everybody's uh, responsibility. Yeah, hope, yeah everyone can Thank you. contribute to that. Jasmine. And I think just based on the conversations here, right, um, I'm, and I'm sure we all have a takeaway, and I personally have a takeaway from this too, uh, which is going back to, as an example, one of the things that you said, right? Um, so when we start um, looking to hire people for an open source project especially, I think it's important to look at people who are already contributing massively to it and who are not getting recognized in at least in any monetary sense and start giving them the first chance to get engaged. Um, it, uh, there are a lot of, I, I won't get into the details, but there's a lot of takeaway from what you said and you said, and I think it's good for us to start incorporating that. So at least for me, this was a very useful panel. Thanks everybody for participating. Thank you so much for coming.